why Russia wants Hagia Sophia. The first verse there that's on the screen, Romans 13, verse 11 to 12, and that knowing the time that it's now high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The day is far spent, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and, and put on the armor of light. So let's keep that verse in Romans 13 in mind as we go through our class this afternoon. It's high time to awake out of our sleep. And we do pray that the, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ and his return to this earth is, is certainly nigh at hand. As 2 Peter 3 verse 11 reminds us, seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, the present constitution of this world shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the day of the coming of our God. And then last but not least, Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and if our Lord Jesus Christ preached that message of repentance and getting your life in order over 2,000 years ago, what should our response be here today, May of 2024, witnessing all that we have from world events just in the past three or four years? And as Revelation 16 reminds us, Behold, I come as a thief, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to each one of us. Behold, I come as a thief. This is just before the events of Armageddon. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And we know the echo back to Moses. He went up into Mount Sinai. The children of Israel thought in their minds that Moses had forgotten about them or delayed his coming, and they walked naked before their enemies. And so let's not have that happen in our lives. Let's keep our oil in our, in our, in our lamps, and let's be ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is Hagia Sophia, to start first and foremost? Maybe you don't know. I told my mom I was doing a class on Hagia Sophia and why Russia wants it, and she's like, Hagia what? Well, that's Hagia Sophia. It's a, it's a massive church, cathedral. It means divine wisdom in Greek. It's, it's a church of holy wisdom. It's located in modern day Istanbul, a city also known throughout history by a couple of different names. So today it's, it's in Istanbul in, in the country of Turkey. It's been known as Constantinople in history or Byzantium. It's this vast dome structure which overlooks the entrance to the Bosphorus Straits. You can kind of see in the background of the picture there's a body of water. It's a narrow water passageway which connects the Black Sea in the north to the Mediterranean Sea in the south. And it separates two continents. It separates Asia from Europe. Here's a couple of maps. So you can see the marker there for, for Hagia Sophia. That body of water to the north is the Black Sea. The Mediterranean Sea, you can see to the south, so it's in, it's in the area of Europe. There's just a zoom in of that same map, so Black Sea to the north, you can see Hagia Sophia, and then just a few more here. So that's just another, another look at it. And there's that body of water that connects the two, that divides the two continents. It's called the Bosphorus Strait. So again, the Black Sea to the north, the Mediterranean Sea to the south, and, and Hagia Sophia sits right there. And there's a zoom in, you can see Hagia Sophia kind of in the middle of that picture, and that's that body of water that separates the, uh, the two continents where it sits right on the, uh, on the shores. And just to give you a picture, if you're looking across, I've never been, but if you're looking across, you can see some, 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 some tanker ships going through there, cargo ships carrying some pretty big loads. So it's a pretty decent sized body of water, but certainly something that you can, uh, you can see across. And again, there's just another picture of, of Hagia Sophia. So Hagia Sophia itself as a church was the center of Orthodox Christianity, and it remained the world's largest church for well over a thousand years. Um, the city of Constantinople, it was founded by the Romer, Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 30, 324. The city was called Byzantium at that point in time, and he dedicated the city and he renamed it in AD 330, rather modestly after his own name, to Constantinople. And he found the management of his empire rather difficult from the narrow, isolated peninsula of, of Italy and Rome. So he looked for a more centralized location for, for Rome's new capital, moving from Rome to Constantinople, and it then became the, the center of the Eastern Orthodox Empire. Uh, just open your Bibles there to Daniel chapter 2. We'll look at a few verses just to kind of bring us back to, uh, from a Bible prophecy perspective, we're very familiar 
with Daniel chapter 2. But in Daniel chapter 2, this is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And so when we're looking at, at these events through, uh, through history, we're looking at the Eastern Roman leg of, of Nebuchadnezzar's image. So when we're looking through in Daniel chapter 2, and we'll have a picture of that in just a second, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his, uh, in his dream. But verse 32, we see that the image, image head was of fine gold, his breast and arms were of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, so as, as the image would have had, two legs, just like we all have two legs, legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. So we'll talk about those two legs of iron in our class this afternoon. Um, Hagia Sophia history began in the year 537, so it was kind of constructed around 537 when Justinian built this huge church and he employed architects, he employed mathematicians and engineers to design and build this massive church. Remember, this is 537, no cranes or heavy duty machinery to help them in the building of this structure. No expense was uh, spared in the building of this, of this church cathedral. And they searched their empire to get the best materials. It said that when Justinian walked into this for the first time, that he stood for a long time just in this massive uh, dome that was inside, standing in absolute awe. And when he finally opened his mouth to speak, he said, Solomon, I have surpassed thee. With this massive dome, it's believed that at the time it was the world's largest church and it remained that way for well over a thousand years. Uh, just uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. So in Revelation chapter 9, we're talking about an invading power in the, the area that was bound by the Euphrates River. And in symbol in Revelation chapter 9, it describes the Euphrates, the Euphrates River overflowing its bank and bringing judgment on this Eastern Roman Empire that was based in Constantinople here at the time. So in Romans, or sorry, Revelation chapter 9, uh, we read a little bit about this invading power. So in verse 14, we, say, we read about saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And so here we see the area that was bound by the power of the Euphrates overflowing its banks. And that's representing the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim power, the Muslim Turkish power, which came against Eastern Orthodox Church here in Constantinople. We read uh, that the Euphrates River overflowed its banks and in verse 17, um, just kind of jumping in at the, the middle of the verse, uh, or sorry, towards the end of the verse, it said, out of their mouths issue fire and smoke and brimstone, and by these was the third part of men killed. And so the, uh, the, the, the invading power at this time had perfected cannons in their warfare, and so we have a little bit of insight from Revelation here as to how it is portraying this this army coming against them out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now it was the springtime of the year 1453 and this was an, a devastating blow to the Eastern Roman Empire that Mohammed II, he was the leader of the Muslim Turkish power at this time, captured Constantinople. And so the top picture there, you can see the artist's rendition of the cannon fire coming against the city of Constantinople, constantly beating at the walls until it fell down. And the picture below is, is a modern day picture. So still to this day, you can see the ruins of the wall from this cannon fire. And so he took the city in the spring of 1453 and he captured this cathedral, Hagia Sophia, and he performed his Friday prayers inside this. He ordered the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. He added, uh, there's a picture, so you can see the, the conversion of the inside of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. He added, uh, the picture below shows those, those four pillars, they're called minarets, to the exterior, and he covered the Christian icons and the gold mosaics with panels of Arabic religious calligraphy to honor Allah and his prophet Muhammad. And so the bells, the altars were removed and the relics destroyed. The mosaics depicting Jesus, his mother Mary, and Christian saints were eventually uh, destroyed or plastered over. Now what happened in the fall of Constantinople in 1453 by this invading power is that the seat of power moved from Constantinople directly north into Moscow. Moscow became known in history as what was called the Third Rome, and then Russia became heir 
to the Eastern Empire, and this Orthodox religion then moved north, and Russia became the guardian of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so after centuries in the, in the heart of the Muslim Turkish Empire, and just after the defeat of Turkey in World War I, so now we're going back to, to Constantinople, in 1934, Hagia Sophia turned into a museum. So a little bit more modern history, a little bit just, just about 100 years ago, a little bit less than 100 years ago, they took this, this mosque, Hagia Sophia, and in 1934, they, they changed it into a museum. So this is after the time period of World War I. So it's not a mosque anymore, it's just a museum. Come visit the museum. Let's all get along from, from different faiths. So it was, a, it was a, a drive to make Turkey more secular, and it became Turkey's uh, most popular tourist site. It gets more than four million visitors every single year. And you might be thinking, well, that's nice. What relevance does that have to me in May 2024 sitting here? Well, what changed? It was a little known event in the first wave of COVID in 2020. We were all shut in our houses, weren't we? We were worried about Lysol wipes and face masks and whether we'd run out of toilet paper or not that this event took place. And so it was on July 10th of 2020 that we witnessed the world reacting to the conversion of Hagia Sophia from a museum. Remember, all faiths can come to here. It was changed from a museum back into a Muslim mosque by decision of Turkey's leader, Gordon. And so we, we see uh, Istanbul's Hagia Sophia opens as a mosque for First Friday prayers, and towards the bottom of that quote there, you can see the leader of Turkey saying, reverting Hagia Sophia to its original form as a mosque was a dream of my youth. And so as a result of this move, the Orthodox Christian world was angered by this move. And you can see some of the headlines that popped up around this time. The Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox Church to observe a day of mourning for Hagia Sophia. Even the, uh, the Pope got a little bit sad by this. He said it was uh, unacceptable to turn Hagia Sophia, and the Pope was pained as Istanbul Museum reverts to a mosque. And so the widely expected decision um, as a result of turning it back into a mosque uh, resulted in expressed concerns from, from different countries around the world and the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And so the Pope uh, went down to say that Hagia Sophia has held the promise of a peaceful coexistence between Christians and Muslims. So again, it was a museum. We could all come here. We could all get along. An acknowledgement of humanity's yearning for unity and love. Turning Hagia Sophia into a mosque sends a painful message to Orthodox Christians. The decision to convert the building of a, into a mosque reflects Turkey's ambition to recapture the Ottoman glory and power in the region, an aggressive posture evident in the country's military incursions into Syria and Iraq, and bound to further destabilize an already volatile region that remains in a battlefield. So what do we know from history and from Bible prophecy perspective? Well, as I mentioned to you already, uh, there's a picture of the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw and there's two legs in this image. It represents the two sides of the Roman Empire, both Roman in their foundation, but the eastern leg, so that's the leg standing on Constantinople, was influenced by Greek culture and Greek language. So there's two legs of the Roman Empire that need to be standing, one standing in Rome and one standing in Constantinople. So we're really focusing on the, uh, the eastern or the right leg of the eastern Roman Empire in our class this afternoon. And it was at that time period that I already mentioned when Emperor Constantine moved his capital to the eastern part of the Roman Empire and he chose the place of, of Byzantine because of its strategic value. We already talked about where it was dividing the two continents, Europe and Asia, the Bosphorus Straits where you can, you can bring cargo in by ship and things like that. And so he refounded the city in AD 330 and he named it Constantinople as we've already mentioned there. And though efforts to take the Greek Orthodox religion of Christianity to the vast territories directly north of Constantinople were initially unsuccessful, it was around the, uh, the end of the 10th century that Vladimir the Duke of Kiev in modern day Ukraine made the decision to adopt this Greek Orthodox religion of Christianity as the religion of his people. And so he sent ambassadors to Constantinople to assess this religion 
And they went into this famous cathedral, Hagia Sophia. They were obviously overwhelmed by the beauty of this structure. And they were quoted, we didn't know if we were in heaven or on earth walking into Hagia Sophia. And so they took the, uh, the, blue, the beauty and the splendor of this Eastern Orthodox religion back to Vladimir, the Duke of Kiev, and he decided to choose this as his national state religion. And so in 89-88, orders went out for all of his subjects in Kiev to be baptized. Now, they didn't spend the time to actually teach people their religion. Knowledge or conviction wasn't necessary. They just baptized the, uh, the entire subjects in their country. And so carrying on through history, as we've already mentioned, it was the springtime in 1453 and a devastating blow to this Eastern Roman Empire that Mohammed II, leader of the Muslim Turks, captured Constantinople with his cannon fire and the victorious conqueror performed Friday prayers inside Hagia Sophia and he changed it into a mosque. Now, one of the effects of the fall of Constantinople was that the legal su succession of the Byzantine Empire and the leadership of the Eastern Orthodox Church was moved from Constantinople to the third Rome, which was in Moscow. So if you look in the top corner there, you can see the words three Romes. Um, this is inside Hagia Sophia. And there's just a, a blow up of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that picture there. So you can see Rome, Constantinople, and directly to the north, you can see Moscow known as the Third Rome. It's commonly taught in the Russian Orthodox religion because Rome, being the first Rome, and Constantinople, being the second Rome, were both overrun throughout history that Moscow, the Third Rome, was commissioned by God to be the final repository of true Christianity. And this vision of a holy Russia has created a sense of world destiny and superiority among the Russians. Well, in, in history, in 1453, when the city of Constantinople fell to Muhammad and the invading power in 1453, at the request of the Pope, the last niece of the empire, you see her up there, her name's Zoe, she was brought to Rome and her education was supervised. And so she's up there on, uh, on the one side there, that's Empress Zoe, and she's on this mosaic inside Hagia Sophia. And... Um, that's a picture in, in their depiction of Jesus sitting in the middle with the golden background, giving his blessing with the right hand and holding the Bible in his left hand. And so Zoe was offered as a prize to a leader who would further the interest of the Orthodox Church. And so we, she was offered in marriage to Ivan of Moscow. And when the, the Pope at the time saw the projected marriage as a possibility of winning over a military ally in Moscow, for the cause of the holy war against the Muslim Turks um, and, and to further the increase the prestige of the Roman Catholic Church in the East. And so Zoe, who was renamed Sophia, left for Moscow in Russia and she took with her the influence of this Eastern Orthodox religion from Constantinople due north to Moscow. And so by this, the legal succession and the leadership of the Eastern Orthodox Church moved from Constantinople, or what's known as the Second Rome, due north to Moscow, the Third Rome. What you see there is a picture of a white ivory throne. We'll talk about that in a second. And right on the top of it is a double-headed eagle. There's a, a blow up on the other side there of, the, of that double-headed eagle. And you'll see that pop up in Russia today. And so the Romans throughout history regard the one who possesses the royal regalia as having the authority to rule, no matter where they were throughout the world. So Sophia took with her up to Moscow, she took the gifts and the emblems of her position from the imperial palace in Constantinople, directly north, and that included this white ivory throne on which was carved the double-headed eagle, the symbol of the ruling power of the Byzantium Empire. Sophia was pleased with the idea of Moscow being the third Rome, especially after the overrun of Constantinople in 1453 to the Muslim Turks and the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. So she packed her bags and she moved due north to Moscow and she brought the influence of the Eastern Orthodox Church and its grand ceremonies to the Kremlin in Russia and greatly influenced the Russian culture. So establishing Moscow as the third Rome gave a sense of mission for the Russian people and their ruler. 
And so her husband, Ivan, adopted the golden Byzantine double-headed eagle, that symbol that you see there in his first sealed document in 1472, making his direct claim to the Roman imperial heritage and posing as a sovereign equal and rival to the Holy Roman Empire. And so you see the double-headed eagle was of the family crest of Sophia, and then that little red box with the horse in the middle was Ivan's family crest. And that symbol is used in Russia to this day. And it was through Sophia's eldest son that she was grandmother to an individual in history known as Ivan the Terrible. You might have heard of him. He was the first czar of all of Russia. And so the title czar is the, the equivalent in Latin of Caesar. And Ivan the Terrible adopted this, this, this symbol of the twin eagles and furthered the establishment of Moscow as the third Rome, giving, giving a sense of purpose to the Russian people and their ruler, developing themselves into the Eastern Orthodox power and defender of the Eastern Orthodox religion. So a variation of the, the Russian Orthodox cross, which is still used to this day, it's called the cross over the crescent, came in 1486 when Ivan the Terrible conquered a city called Kazan. Kazan is in Russia, it's, it's as far north as Moscow, and this city had been under the rule of the Muslim Empire. In remembrance of this, he decreed that from henceforth the Islamic crescent, the moon that you can see at the bottom there, um, would be placed at the bottom of the cross to signify the victory of the cross or their, or their version of Orthodox Christianity over the, the crescent over Islam through its soldiers. And it was in 1551 that the Russian Orthodox Church decided to standardize the cross on Rush, Russian church domes to distinguish it from, from all the other crosses out there. The cross over the crescent to signify on their churches the victory of the, the cross, Christianity, over the crescent Islam through their soldiers. And it was under the leadership of Ivan the Terrible that the Russians believed that they were the rightful heirs to the Eastern Roman Empire, the capital city of Constantinople that they were booted out of in 1453. They have always claimed that the territory in southeastern Europe, bordering the Black Sea and the Straits, belonged to them. And this claim has involved them in more than one war in the area throughout history. Russia has always kept their eyes on the city of Constantinople in modern-day Turkey and Hagia Sophia as their prize. Even from a geographic perspective, this area of the world represents the only waterway for Russia to enter the Mediterranean Sea from the Black Sea. So strategically, from a, a military perspective, for moving ships, it's an important area. Well, after Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque in July 2020, there was an interview that took place up in Russia and the reaction uh, to Hagia Sophia. And this is what the, the reporter had to say. This cathedral turned into a museum, now turned back into a mosque, has always been at the very heart of the Eastern Orthodox Christian community. It's revered as the site of its founding, if you like, of the Eastern Orthodox Christianity in Constantinople. Istanbul, was the end of the Roman Empire. It therefore holds a particular place in the hearts of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Patriarch Kirill, so he's the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church, spoke about this earlier in the week in a very strong terms. And saying that would be converted back into a mosque would be an attack on all of Orthodox faith and would cause deep pain to the Russian people. To the Eastern Orthodox Church, this is at the very heart of their belief. This is where very early the heads of the church were established and crown, and there's a lot of important history today. Just another quote, this is from the Atlantic, and just taking up a few lines from the last uh, paragraph of the quote there, it says, for over a thousand years, Russia has had the vision of Constantinople at the center of Russian power. Her first ascent was made upon it in the ninth century, and the latest in the 19th century. We'll talk a little bit about World War I from history and Russia's descent in the 19th century. Even National Geographic has this quote. It says, since claiming the Byzantine birth, Russia has always looked possessively and obsessively south. Like the Greeks, Catherine the Great has had her own great idea, a Byzantine empire, that's that area of Constantinople, 
in the Balkans to be, to be ruled from a reconquered Constantinople. Ironically, Russia came within a hairbreadth of gaining Constantinople in the Straits, that's that waterway, the Straits, in World War I. We'll talk about that a little bit and why that couldn't happen in World War I. The Allies, the, the countries that were allied to Russia in World War I, promised them to her upon Turkey's defeat. <clears throat> Just have a little water here. And then her, her revolution knocked Russia out of the war, scuttling that prospect. <clears throat> so there's this, uh, just before we get into who this is, when Russia claimed the birthright to the Byzantine Empire, they are claiming that they became the third Rome because the heir of the Byzantine Empire, Sophia, moved north to Moscow. And so because Constantinople is in modern day Turkey, the Russians think that their throne of their empire should be down in Constantinople. And even the leader, the present leader of, of Russia, Putin, has said constantly and in, in, in times past that he wants Hagia Sophia to be a cathedral, a, a church. And he wants to take military control of Constantinople. Well, there's this uh, individual called Vladimir Zirinovsky, and he wrote, he wrote a book in 1995 there's a picture of Zirinovsky with Putin in the, in the bottom corner called The Last Dash South. And quotes out of this, you could almost take an overlay into Ezekiel 38 or into Daniel chapter 11 that we'll talk about in a little bit. So he wrote this in The Last Dash South. So he's a Russian politician. He has the ear of Vladimir uh, Putin. He said he expressed his worldview since the 1980s I have elaborated a geopolitical conception, the last break southward, Russia's reach to the shores of the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. This is really the solution for the salvation of the Russian nation. It solves all problems and we gain tranquility. Russia will rule the space from Kabul, that's Afghanistan, to Istanbul, Turkey. The United States would feel safer with the Russian rule in the region since wars there would cease under Russian rule. Perhaps some people in Kabul, Tehran, so that's modern-day Iran, or in Kara, Turkey, would not like it, but many people would feel better. The Persians and the Turks would suffer a little bit, but the rest would gain. And then the area in red there, the bells of the Orthodox Church, so that's coming in Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, must ring from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. And then, of course, Jerusalem becomes close. It's necessary that the Christian world reunifies in Jerusalem. And he goes on to even say he can solve the Palestinian problem. The Palestinian problem can further be solved by the partial transfer of the Palestinian population to the former territories of Turkey and Iran. So that's quite interesting. Written in 1995, you can buy the book on Amazon if, if you'd really like Vladimir Zirinovsky and his Lash Dash South. Well, the Christadelphian magazine ran an article in January 2019 about some history of World War I and how it connects with aspects of Bible prophecy. And we know that the most important outcome from World War I in history from a biblical perspective as Bible students was the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, providing a homeland, paving the way for a homeland for the Jews. But that was far from the mind of the Allied generals at the time period. We know that God rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomsoever he will to direct his plans. And that while the allied generals in World War I may have had their own agenda, unbeknown to them there is a godly agenda that was running parallel and would take precedence over their plans. And so a major objective of the early part from World War I from the allied perspective was to gain control of the Dardanelles Straits. So that's that body of water, the Bosphorus Straits um, that runs up by Constantinople the Sea of Marmara, which is in the middle, so that's just the little water body that connects the Black Sea in the north to the Mediterranean Sea in the south, and they wanted to control this seaway to provide a safe passage for the transportation of ships from the Mediterranean Sea to enter the Black Sea to bolster the Russian military capability to enable them to, to mount a successful campaign on the eastern front against Germany. And if the Allies control this area, it'd also take Turkey out of the war. Turkey was allied to, uh, to Germany's side. And while Britain and her allies wanted Russia to assist by attacking the Turkish forces, by coming down from the north, from the Black Sea in the north, 
Um, in his history of World War I, a, a British captain, his name is Sir Basil Hart, he gives us insight to Russia's ambition during World War I. So Winston Churchill, who was the leader of England at this time, made attempts to strengthen his plan by suggesting to the Grand Duke Nicholas, so he was the, uh, the leader of Russia, that Russians should cooperate in a land and sea attack in the area of the Bosphorus Straits. It proved void because the political aspect dominated here was in the minds of Russia's strategists. Strong was the Russian desire to possess Constantinople that they didn't want to cooperate with their allies to gain this area. And so the cornerstone of Russian policy was the annexation of both Constantinople and the Bosphorus Straits. And the Russian foreign minister at this point in time was recorded as saying, I intensely dislike the thought that the Straits might be taken by our allies and not directly by the Russian forces. So it's significant that the Russian military here were very determined to fulfill Russia's long-held ambition to take back Constantinople, the spiritual heart of the Russian Eastern Orthodox Church from the world of Islam, and to do so without the help from outside forces. Now, interestingly enough, Russia actually came within a hairbreadth of gaining Constantinople and the Bosphorus Straits in World War I. The Allies had actually promised them to Russia upon Turkey's defeat. So the Allied nations in World War I, just a little history lesson for you there, the, the, uh, the people who, who, um, who were aligned, the central powers, it was Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Turkish Ottoman Empire, they are known as the central powers. And they were fighting against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan, and the United States, known as the Allied powers. What happened is Russia was actually taken out of World War I through the Russian Revolution. There was an individual who started the Russian Revolution in 1917 known as Vladimir Lenin, and he uh, started the Russian Revolution and he took Russia out of the war of World War I. Now, if we just take a step back and think about this from a Bible prophecy perspective, why could Russia not take Constantinople in 1917, but they could do so today. We know from Bible prophecy perspective that if Russia has Constantinople, the next thing that it tells us that it's going to do is come down into the Middle East further and invade Israel. But of course, in 1917, at this point in time in history, Israel as a nation did not exist at this time. The Jews were not gathered back into Israel. And that didn't happen in large volumes until after the persecution of the Jews and the Holocaust in World War II. So Russia could not be on the border of Israel in 1918, but they certainly can be there today. So there is a pause in Russia, this Russian revolution or communism took hold of Russia. And for the next 70 years or so from 1918, communism ruled in Russia until 1989. Fast forward to today, Israel's back in their land, looking to move into the area of the mountains of Israel, the disputed area of the West Bank, the hill country of Judea and Samaria. And so we know that God is still very active and alive in control of the events and, the, and in the nations today. And so you might have seen that image, the, uh, the hammer and the sickle, it was in 1917 through the Russian revolution, revolution through, through communism, that the crest of the double-headed eagle was pulled down by Lenin and in place, he put in the hammer and the sickle standing for the working man. The hammer representing the poor industrial workers and the sickle representing the poor field workers and farmers. And that symbol of Russia was used from 1917 till about 1989, because it was under, under uh, Vladimir Putin who came, who came into rulership of Russia that the hammer and sickle emblem was scrapped and he readopted the ancient emblem of the double-headed eagle. And as news articles at that point in time stated, the eagle has landed in Moscow. And with that, Putin's new constitution stated that Russia is an Orthodox Christian nation. And so this is a very major and significant change that occurred in Russia from the fall of atheist communism in Russia to become a, an Orthodox Christian nation. Well, we saw the reconversion of Hagia Sophia from a museum back into a mosque in July 2020. And we pause and we think, is this going to be the event which provokes Russia to stake her claim 
on Constantinople. It was back in 2015 and within a couple of weeks of Turkey, Turkey at this point in time downed a Russian jet that was in Turkish airspace, that the leader of Turkey received a threatening letter from Moscow demanding the return of Hagia Sophia to the Russian Orthodox Church. That, of course, hasn't happened as of yet. And so we see news headlines like this. Hagia Sophia, Igordan, who's the, the leader of Turkey, presents himself as a reincarnation of the Ottoman Empire. And so the decision to restore the status of Hagia Sophia to a mosque is a very important step, which he's trying to do to connect the modern state of Turkey to the legacy and the rebuilding of the Ottoman Empire. And as this says here, World, the, the bottom quote from the president there says, World War I was described as a fight to grab a share of Ottoman lands in an era when the world order is shaken at its foundation. We will frustrate those who dream the same about the Republic of Turkey. Now we know from, from history that the, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey controlled a vast empire in the Middle East and Asia for about 400 years up until World War I, 1917. We considered the symbol of the Ottoman Empire referred to as the Euphrates River, which was known to overflow its banks, um, a symbol of the Ottoman Empire and its growth and peak in the Middle East. The Ottoman Turks, who burst their banks around, around the year 1299 in history, flooded the Byzantine Empire, eventually taking Constantinople in 1453. Since that time, it occupied the ancient homeland of the Jewish people until 1917. And uh, if you have your Bibles open there, just turn with me to, uh, to Revelation 16 at verse 12. And so that kind of brings us up to, uh, to more modern day times, the last days, the time period that we're living in here. So Revelation 16 at verse 12 tells us, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And so we see the drying up of the Euphrates River continued to take place until 1917 in World War I, when a key outcome from World War I was the declaration of a homeland for the nation of Israel. So what we would expect from a Bible prophecy perspective would be the continual drawing up of the Turkish Ottoman Empire against direct threats as to what the leader is stating right here. So what reaction there might be on a world stage with the move of Hagia Sophia from a museum to a mosque remains to be seen. But we know that ultimately Turkey, with a remnant of the Muslim Turkish power, will continue to dry up in that area. And there will either be cooperation or otherwise, perhaps even a military takeover between Russia and the area um, down in Constantinople. We know that a move by Russia into modern-day Istanbul, known as Constantinople through history, will take place. Russia will then be firmly in a position to be known as what's called in the Bible as the King of the North from Daniel chapter 11 in preparation to move down into Israel, the glorious land. Now, we don't know exactly when Daniel chapter 11 will take place. If you actually just want to turn back with me there, we'll conclude in this section here. We don't know exactly when the end of the events of Daniel 11 will take place, but we do know that we are living in that time period that's been referred to as the last days. And of course, Hagia Sophia would be part of this prize to them in the Eastern Orthodox uh, Church and, and how it's been a, an important symbol to them throughout history. Here's just a quote before we get into Daniel chapter 11. This was from Brother John Thomas. He wrote in 1861 a book called Eureka. And the quote goes on to say, The wrath of the six files, so that's the six file that we read about in Revelation 16, was designed to dry up the great Turkish power in order to put in its place a stronger and greater power, the Muscovite, before the coming of Christ. We have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople and is overflowing and passing over stretching forth his power over Egypt in the Holy Land. This will certainly come to pass, but it will be consequent upon not antecedent to the appearing of Jesus Christ. And if you've read through some parts of Eureka or Elpis Israel, you probably have to have a dictionary out when you're reading through because we don't really use the word consequent and antecedent in our everyday language, but consequent means following, and antecedent means forerunning or predecessor 
our predecessor. So Brother Thomas believed from, his, his, uh, from reading Bible prophecy was that when Russia advances to take Turkey and Hagia Sophia, that we will already be called away to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in Mount Sinai for, for judgment. Well, he wrote, prior to Eureka, he wrote the book Alpha's Israel in 1848, Brother Thomas, and he said, when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things as present constituent is at hand. Well, we know Russia is on the move to build up its, its image empire because it was, I don't know about you, but I remember February 24th of, of 2022, we saw Russia building up its armies on the border with Ukraine, and I thought in this day and age, we would never see them spill over and go into Ukraine, but we witnessed that, didn't we? February 24th, 2022. And the spike that you see there on the chart is the US readership of articles related to the Ukraine war. And so that's in February, 2022. And I remember that, that specific day on the calendar, just like we have other specific days that you might remember. Russia was building up its armies on the border of Ukraine. And, and that was my spiritual awareness to what was going on in the world. It, it spiked just like everyone else did reading the news headlines. This is really happening. And then of course, life just continues on from there. And then we saw other major events like we saw October 7th last year and the terrible events that took place in Israel and the following rise in anti-Semitism. Well, the risk is, is that when time passes, is that our spiritual awareness to events like this take place, they spike at a time period like this, or they spike like the beginning of COVID, and then they just taper off, they flatline from there. And so that's certainly a warning to each one of us to keep that spiritual awareness in each one of our lives as we see these events taking place. And so let's just uh, conclude with the, the verses that we open with from Daniel chapter 11. And so up on the screen there, Daniel chapter 11, the white is from the King James, the green is just a, a little bit of addition to maybe help give some context to, uh, to what's taking place in these verses. We know Daniel chapter 11 describes events in the last days or the latter days. It starts off by reading, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now we know by studying Daniel chapter 11 that the him in verse 40 is Turkey, as it was said that the king of the south would push at the Turkish Empire, in 19, and they did so in 1917, driving it out of the Middle East, paving the way for Israel to return to their land. Well, we're right in the middle of Daniel 11 at verse 40, that little pause after the semicolon, you wanted to insert ourselves, that's where we are. Continuing on in Daniel chapter 11, we find the king of the north, which is the same terminology of the power of Rosh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, pushing at Turkey, overflowing and going down in, through Israel and into Egypt. And so it continues on to read there, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horses, and with many ships he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. So we see the king of the north, Russia and her allies coming against him, which is Turkey, with chariots, horsemen, and ships. And so we know this will be both a land and a sea invasion. And like in Ezekiel 38, um, he's described as Gog of the land of Magog. He is interested in the spoil of the land. He doesn't stop in Turkey uh, with Hagia Sophia, but Ezekiel describes him as thinking an evil thought and going right through down into Israel and pushing all the way down into Egypt. So when we see events like this happening, such as the conversion of Hagia Sophia back into a mosque, 
we can confidently see that the return of our Lord Jesus Christ must be at the doorstep, that we need to be preparing our lives, we need to make sure that we're putting daily oil, the oil of the Word of God, in our lamps. So ultimately we pray that the return of our Lord Jesus Christ will soon come, whose right it is to reign as King over all this earth, as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords. For at that time, the King of the North, having failed to take Jerusalem, shall come to his end and none will be able to help him.